Hi everyone, happy Friday. I am Avery Willis Hoffman, Program Director at the Park Avenue Armory. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm joining you all from Brewster, New York, the occupied and unceded homeland of the Wappingers, the Muncie speaking Delawares. I am a mixed race woman with brownish golden short curly hair. Today I'm wearing a burnt orange headband, red lipstick, orange earrings, and I have a white wall as background behind me. Thank you, Josie, for that beautiful welcome song entitled Deep Snow. All of our conversations are framed by our acknowledgement of the native stewards of the lands on which we presently live. We pay respect to all their ancestors as well as present and future generations. We acknowledge that many indigenous people continue to live and work on these lands and we honor their ongoing contributions to our world. So on behalf of the Park Avenue Armory and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, I'm so pleased to welcome you back to our 100 Years, 100 Women conversation series. And so many thanks to those of you who have joined us for our first six episodes. These Friday gatherings have been really a wonderful way to touch base with the artists and participants in our 100 Years, 100 Women project, which is a year long response to the centennial of the 19th Amendment to the US Constitution, which granted some but not all women the right to vote. So please feel free to grab a, grab a beverage and food and participate in the YouTube chat, uh, post your questions there throughout the conversation. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Warrington, our host today from the Museum of the Moving Image for a few words of welcome, and then on to the conversation with Shala. Enjoy. Let me begin by words of thank you to you, Avery. Uh, when you call me about this incredible gathering, uh, and, and it was like instantly, there are certain women that this should be the platform for celebration. So the first person, the person I call was Shaula because her whole career has been dedicated to this kind of, I call it collecting the receipts, not to be acknowledged to the folks who have done this work. But also before I get to that, let me say how wonderful it is for the, the event to be, to also give tribute to the, the native people uh, that's a, because I feel that part because I'm both sides of my family. The first generation in my lineage is Cherokee and African. So I am love the fact that, that that's not been erased. So what a smart thing this institution has done to integrate that kind of uh, acknowledgement. And, but um, 
I also want to start off by saying, oftentimes when you have a, a expert and Charlotte Lynch is an expert, they don't get the chance to be acknowledged because they're so busy celebrating everyone else. So before we bring her on stage, on camera, this is a woman who has dedicated her life's work to get, collecting these receipts, to celebrating and documenting those women who have been unacknowledged or not properly or fully acknowledged starting with Shirley Chisholm, straight through Angela Davis, but she's also a, a curator, scholar. And I, that really speaks to me because one of the most influential women in, in my work as an artist was Catherine Dunham, who's both an artist and a scholar. So I'm very pleased to bring Charlotte Lynch on camera because um, you should all know, full disclosure, you are joining a conversation that's been in progress for years now. So I'm trying not to do shorthand because we've covered so much, but Charlotte, Please join us. Hi, Warrington. Well, thank you for that introduction, Avery, the Met, you know, the Armory. Um, what, a, what a wonderful um, gathering. And I'm looking forward to continuing our conversation. So just to uh, say my name, title, pronouns, I am Shala Lynch. My name is spelled Shola, but pronounced Shala. It's Nigerian. I am a filmmaker for decades, as well as the curator for the Moving Image and Recorded Sound Division at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. I am she, her, hers. Um, land acknowledgement is the Muncie Lenape. And I am a black woman with lots of curly hair and lots of curly energy. <laughs> sitting in front of, uh, I'm in my office at the Schomburg and I have a collage um, receipts, I suppose, in a way, Warrington behind me, <laughs> tribute to favorite people. So, so Shana, I'm trying to figure out the best way to resume this, this, this ongoing conversation we've been having. So one of the things that when I began to make the advocacy 40 years ago for, for African-American filmmakers, I always said that the famous James Baldwin quote, if you don't know my name, you can't know yours. So I think that the African-American voice under completes American history and understanding of American experience. But as you know, I mean, women were late to the game. Black men could vote before black women could vote. And I think artistically, while we can certainly point to some major, unbelievably important women in history, that's always a, a resistance and marginalization. So what is the thing that we continue to lose by not allowing women to have the mic? So, uh, I mean, first of all, that is a thesis question and that will be our hour to like okay. to yeah. kind of, <laughs> Warren did. So I need to kind of break it down in our, in our yeah. conversation. Um, but before I, before I do that, I think that it's worthwhile for us to talk about our POV and how we come to um, our view on this important piece of history. I, um, I'm humbled that you call me an expert. I don't feel like an expert. I feel like I know that I don't know everything. That's my expertise. And, and that's I'm a real, curious. that's a genuine expertise though, knowing yeah. what you don't know. <laughs> and I remain curious. Um, and I think that as a, a black woman in the field of filmmaking, it's up to me and us to kind of be, to be the archaeologists, mm -hmm. to bring forward the people that came before us because it allows us to stand a little taller. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the flip side of what you were talking about in terms of race and gender in the United States of America, you know, these are themes that we touched on in the 100 Years 100 Women Project, right? We don't know our histories, but that doesn't mean we weren't there. Mm. It, it also doesn't mean that we weren't doing, but because we weren't men, it was acknowledged in a different way. So we might be the wife of, right? Or the sister of, you know, for instance, let's take James Vanderzee. Like we know his photography, right? And we celebrate him. Do you know he had a sister? Mm -hmm. And do you know her sister, his sister made a film or two and was married to a filmmaker? Right. And so what we need to be looking at uh, the social networks of the people that we know to identify the women who have been it, it, black famous, like famous in their time, known within the circles, but not didn't cross over. Right. 
So there's that part. And there's also the idea that we have to recognize that the lack of opportunities means that we're not as present in the history. So we have work to do, we have mining to do, um, but it's not as though we weren't there. And I think that is a really key thing for all of us as artists to remember. And, and may I pick up what you said earlier, because um, I, I did a documentary ooh, Jesus, 15 years ago called Unstoppable, in which I had the three pioneers of, of who broke into Hollywood with Melvin Van Peebles, Ossie Davis, and Ruby Dee. I'm talking about Rossi Davis and uh, um, Melvin Ossie uh, and um, Gordon. Gordon Parks. And trying to be provocative, to, to open the door that it doesn't normally get open, I asked them that my first question, who were the women in your life and how did they, they uh, influence you? And the answers are so different. But I think that, that uh, to, to your point, that presence is as important as all the other influences in their life, maybe more important. And not to give you new projects, I'm sure you got a stack of them, but <laughs> I, I'm serious about the women, the unacknowledged women behind these, all these giants. That would be a very interesting project. Yeah, I mean, but you know, you can't say Ossie Davis's name without saying Ruby D. And like, he you said cannot. that. You cannot. He said, he In said, fact, Paul I, Robeson, right? To even mm. take it back, you can't really talk about Paul Robeson's career without talking about particularly his second wife, yes. who was also making films, right? Yes. But, she, but she wasn't the star in the family because of the way race, well, gender. Well, I think was so progressive. He says that, he says, I don't know where my, my I end and she begins. I mean, he was the one person who was really recognized her as an equal. And, in fact, I found out something yesterday, and I, I should know this. Yeah, I, I, I may be an expert too, I don't know. And that she wrote the screenplay to the Jules Dassin film, Uptight. I did not know that. Well, okay, then good, we're two experts. We're both better experts now. Exactly. And, and so like, she is so utterly amazing. I get a chance to, to work with her and they're just, she's just stunning in every way. And so- okay. Yes, yeah, so I have to make- plug for the Schomburg before we move on though. Go ahead now. Right. We we've purchased, we have the Ossie Davis and Ruby D collection here. It is not fully processed, so it's not yeah. publicly available yet. Yeah. But I cannot wait to discover um, her voice really and to be able to tease out her contribution to their collective amazing careers. And I, I want to salute to an, another collection you you acquired too that I think it's over 700 films between 19 19- 63 and, and year 2000, <laughs> independent film work. So I, I think that you, you, you've been, you're doing amazing work there. The Black Filmmaker Foundation. Oh, Black. yes, I've heard yeah, of those you, guys. I knew you forgot the name of that. Well, you know, and so I think that the, so people often ask me as a filmmaker, why are you at the Schomburg? Like, what is, the, what is that about? I love um, unearthing stories we think we know and telling them in ways in which we will never forget them. So Shirley Chisholm's Run for President, Angela Davis, it, it allows us to reconnect with people in the past and for those stories. But being here means that the archive, right, is, uh, so let me use Schomburg's words. Like he talked, it, he wrote in his essay, The Negro Digs Up His Past, about what he was doing, collecting, and he'd been told as a kid that black history didn't exist. Imagine that, right? Which is what happens to women, women of color. There's nobody that came before you. There's no history. That's, that's, a, um, that's a violent erasure of what we've been able to contribute to our world, right? And he comes to New York, Schomburg, in the early 20th century before the Harlem Renaissance. And he's got a job as a mail clerk and he's discovering books by and about black people, you know, photos, art, all of that. And he writes in his essay, um, The Negro Digs Up His Past, and he names his collection, which becomes 10,000 items by 1925, as vindicating evidences, right? The vindicating evidences. He wasn't going to argue with his school teacher. He was going to collect and prove otherwise. And it is no mistake that it's not vindicating evidence it's zzz. Yeah. And those 10,000 items, talk about dropping the mic 10,000 times, right? Right? It are now, you know, 11 million and counting, probably closer to 13 million. And it's really important to have the evidence 
of our um, intellect, our contribution, our um, similarities, our differences, our arguments, like to create the, the larger portrait of who we are as people of color. And when we're talking about women, absolutely, right? Absolutely, we're, we're not a monolith and it is our point, it is our perspective that um, we need to dig deeper into. Sure, sure. And, and, and I'm glad you mentioned that we're not a, the women and people are not monoliths because the voices, I mean, so you have um, um, a great pioneer in, in sci-fi, Octavia, you know, and then you balance that against uh, the uh, voices in, 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 in um, narrative and poetry voices. I mean, the women, I think the voices are just a symphony of all different flavors and tones. It's just wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, so I would say yeah. that lack of historical investigation and also um, lack of uh, the ability to imagine within historical analysis, we lose a lot of women before the 60s, right? Like, like the filmmakers. I mean, we yeah. have Laura Neale Hurston, you know, who are multi hyphenates, right? Yes, yes, yes. Um, and women who are attached to men. But the 60s, right, allows this opening up. I mean, within tragedy, which kind of resonates, doesn't kind of resonate so much with our moment here with Black Lives Matter and opportunities open up, but with the civil rights movement and the assassination of Martin Luther King, opportunities opened up in television and in filmmaking in a way um, that hadn't happened before. And so we get, we have more evidences, right? Yeah, like yeah. the LA Rebellion folks out in, uh, you're smiling. You, you don't like that phrase, LA Rebellion. Oh, but like, no, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, um, I'm, I, I bring another, a different scholarship, that's all. Okay, okay, well, just you bring it, bring it, bring it, bring it, bring it. No, it's all good, it's all good. Yeah. Um, but, but I will say though, that, that uh, this, this arc, uh, in my bias, um, I think that Catherine Dunham <clears throat> was one of the most profound arcs I mean, um, she's born in 19, you know, no, not before 1920. And so all of those different cycles, she was there. I mean, think about it. She was in a Hollywood movie back in, 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 in the, uh, was it 40s and 50s? And, and when the, the Black Power movement, the Black Conscious movement, she was in the center of that. In fact, I, my consciousness came from being in her affiliation and her instruction. So she's a person who, and also she's a Pan-Africanist and it's a cultural Pan-Africanist. So she connects Haiti and Cuba and Brazil with, with, with East St. Louis and Chicago. And that's pretty profound. And I can't, quite frankly, I can't think of a man of a similar pedigree and imprint. Yes, you know, and you were asking earlier what women bring um, and somebody like Catherine Dunham and I would say Zora Neale Hurston before her in a sense they they have to document their own work and they have to in a sense document themselves mm -hmm. right like what they're doing is in part anthropological right and yeah. it is connecting with the world around them not in one way but in so many different ways that they're very multi-hyphenate and that that is hugely important. And I would say that as women, we sometimes have to be our own best advocates in the film space. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that we can't wait for other people to give us permission or to come or can't rely on acknowledgement um, or opening up of opportunity that we have to, we have to make those opportunities in a way that um, our male counterparts don't always. Well, and I, I go a step further that any artist who depends on acknowledgement, you know, has disadvantaged themselves. Um, uh, one thing I, I give all praise to my mother, she, created a, a, a self-esteem and self-confidence uh, uh, self I've never, ever needed, desired, or even entertained outside vindication. My mother said, this is who you are, this is what you gotta do. And so I was good. And so every artist that needs that, who laments that they don't get that, I think doesn't have the same advantage because the stories we're telling will be opposed, absolutely opposed at every turn. And if you speak out, then there will be consequences. Yes, 
right? Yes, yes, yes. That that you know the the idea of the warring souls and the points of view, um, the internal or personal or in group versus um, what is sellable, right? That's all, like fighting with stereotypes and fighting um, those issues to create work is always a part of always a part of the process. But I do think we have filmmakers to kind of name, right? You know, yeah. like, yeah. So if we're talking about the 60s, 70s and 80s, there are a lot more women who are part of that conversation, mm -hmm. you know, um, and there are some real pioneers like Julie Dash being being one of them, right? Yeah. Sure. Um, and so, so should we talk about their work? Yes, please do. Yeah. Oh, you're putting, no, it's conversation. It's okay, conversation. okay, okay, okay. Well, then, then okay. Yes, well, then, um, good news, and uh, I guess it's good news, but all the pioneers, I, I was there. I met them. We're the same generation. Yes. I don't think they're my younger, no. So we're all the same, same gen, well, older I met. So, um, but just, I'm just in awe. And so um, then there are people, I want to use the opportunity to talk about this. There are people who I think are beyond brilliant and we know them, but they still have yet to get the platform to do the things I know they can do because I talk to them all the time. I'm thinking specifically about Darnell Martin. And we know her from the movie, I Like I Like That and Cadillac Record, but she is unbelievably brilliant filmmaker. And she has different projects that she, you know, I, I see the scripts. And again, the same resistance men face, women face, but women face it with the extra layer of sexism, that, that it's additional marginalization. But she is fierce and she's gonna win and be taken harder and longer. Yeah, or, or we go into television. So, you know, um, the, the women who come out of the LA Rebellion and, you know, Julie Dash is always top of mind. Mm -hmm. um, in, in making small short films, right? And then going on to make Daughters of the Dust, which was the first uh, film by a black director who, woman director in theaters is my, right? I'm a fact check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, I think yeah. that's, I think that's right. Yeah, and did, it, it does quite well. Did. Type into the chat box. So I we know can exactly. Her, you know, <laughs> I, I think Maya Angelou did something. But and Maya later, right, makes yeah. uh, makes her directorial debut um, with Alfred Water as the star. Um, but I, in the doc vein, there's Madeline yeah. Anderson, absolutely, and sure. who comes out of the opening up of journalism and documentary making related to PBS, right? Because government mandate to like to to diversify the voices, and she's part of Black Journal and and goes on to make um, documentaries. Hey, can I, I'm, I'm gonna share some trivia with you. Okay. When I got to college and, and it came to New York, this is like, it's, you know, 1975. And I got my first grant to do a documentary. Uh, and I didn't know anybody or anything, but there was a woman who worked at a, a commercial company. They did trailers, I forget the name of the company, but they did trailers for movie trailers. And for whatever reason, she just like adopted me. And she would, you know, she would, any question I have about post-production, I could go to her. She helped me. She helped me get an editing room, 1600 Broadway. And it was just wonderful. And so um, and she was much, much, much older woman. And then I got a call maybe a year ago. from this guy says, um, did you know uh, T? Her name, full name was T Beveridge. I said, yeah, of course. Oh, she was wonderful. She helped me. She definitely said, okay. I said, well, why are you calling? He said, I'm writing a book about her. Oh, really? About filmmakers, he says, no, no, no. He said, what's the book about? He says, women who were sales with the Communist Party from Russia, who were sent to, who were in the United States to, to solicit. Now, I said, what? Now, ironically, I was so unbelievably radical at the time, they'd be going backwards, reaching out to me, because I was hardcore, you know, red, black, and green, black, Panther Party, you name it. But, and she never solicited me, but I guess I was already, you know, on the road. But she was so helpful to me and many other young filmmakers. And no one, we mentioned the others, and I just want to make sure her name, Hortense Beveridge, gets mentioned as well. Yeah, right, 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 right. I should have like put together a complete list that I could just like, oh, oh, like no, a no, poem. No. 
just name the names. I mean, then, I feel like then the, whole, then the whole hour be gone. We, yeah, we exactly. Can't do it that way. <laughs> I, guess. I, mean, I think that, the, but but I mentioned that only because it was such a personal connection for me that the, the yep. difference he made, you know. And um, what well, for example, what woman in your personal life as a filmmaker who who touched you, who helped you, who made the difference? You know, she's only coming to filmmaking, but she's been in the community of filmmakers. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I just like so many women, come, like the women in my personal trajectory. I mean, Deborah Willis is number one, oh, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I take my example um, because when I came to filmmaking, I didn't know about filmmakers. I knew about Spike Lee, right? And I knew about Julie Dash, but who could be them, right? That was the, I didn't know the rest of the history, but photographers mm. and the artists like Carrie Mae Weems, who is in the the, the hundred years, you know, uh, piece and Lorna Simpson and Adrian Piper. And I was like, yeah, this is the space that I want to be in the way that I want to think and you know my own trajectory like I didn't know I could be a filmmaker I happened to land a, so I have a master's in American history and public history resource management I wanted to be a curator in a historical cultural institution oh, <laughs> <right>? <laughs> but I couldn't find a job getting in and you know uh, the economic reality set, set in and I landed a job as a researcher for Florentine Films, which was Ken Burns' company. And it was only through working there on the job that I discovered that filmmaking is a collage of images mm -hmm. and it elevates, no, no, it's like the, it's like the gateway drug to higher learning, right? Nobody's gonna read, not nobody, right? Fewer people read academic books, but you can bring people who are interested in these subjects to it by films um, that show and help you feel, right? What it means to be in that person's shoes that, that um, have emotional core. And I think that um, when we talk about lack of imagination around black women, women of color, we're talking about most people not being able to relate to our humanness. And yes. what the work does mm -hmm. from all of our perspectives in all of our all different right. ways with filmmaking is shatters that, right? Let, shatters let, that. Let me, let me change the frame. What you're saying is absolute, of course, I, I think it's self-evident. But there's another frame in which uh, it's not about uh, sharing our, our receipts of our humanity and our artistic uh, historical contribution. The other way you can pick, look at this, this is a war zone. If you think about D.W. Griffin, who's the first celebrated filmmaker, he, be, he made a film, what? To, to, to resurrect the Confederacy, to salute the KKK. And, and if you could, there's a case they can make that the history of, of, of motion pictures and television in the 20th century is to reinforce white hierarchy to, to resurrect and maintain white supremacy. So therefore, if you take that frame, then, then regardless of gender, then you engage in motion pictures to, to reverse or, or, or counterpunch that, that lineage of, of storytelling. And maybe because obviously you and I are different generations and I, I come into this story as, as, a, as a soldier and I'm here to fight. I'm here to say, no, 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 no. I'm telling the story this way because I understand that this tool is to, to disenfranchise me, to marginalize me. And so it's just, I'm just, I'm, I'm just a soldier. But it, I think the, it's a tool for propaganda is what you're saying, right? No, but and the, I, the, I think the that- point the, of view, it, mm -hmm. the point of view doesn't have to be what it has been. I mean, Birth of the Nation is, you know, impacted the society, but it's not the film, right? It was the opportunity for that film the, and the avenues for it to be and the audience, right? And what's missing for us is the opportunity. It's not the talents. Oh, sure. Right? And to prove our business worth in a capitalist society, but it's also good propaganda, right? Like that's part of the thing, part of uh, the frustration uh, is. Uh, uh, good propaganda is, in my view, never explicit. Good yes. propaganda is implicit. Yes. And, and good propaganda is actually art. I mean, yes. because the, 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 the truth in the art 
uh, seeps into your into your into your head and your perception, and you look at things differently. Right. So I'm not suggesting that that any of us uh, should begin making PR public propaganda films. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that the same way that um, well, we have a generation wait, of people wait, wait. who where. It was so I'm sorry to interrupt, right? Because I just want to it, it is it's creating the images that become our history because that's the legacy that's been lost. And that's why black artists, black mm -hmm. women artists are so important because we don't have the vindicating evidences of our history. It's it's very it's it's scant, it's thin. It's like we gotta go back and you know dig into the archives. I so agree. We to recreate but, them. But I want to I agree with you, but I want to change the frame again. Okay. Tarzan is not history. No. But but how many people grew up, you know, again, different generation, looking at Tarzan, yeah, again, yeah, Tarzan, and then and running. And, and so so you can, oh, better still, Westerns as a genre is, is, is racist, imperialistic. I mean, they have taken the assassination of, of, a, of a Native people and turned it into a form of entertainment. So, so it's not just there, the battleground isn't history. Is, 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 is perspective. And so that's a place to enjoy. And, and history, quite frankly, has nothing to do with it. Yeah, it's to like, me, they're what, the same, myth? though. The issue is myth. Can yeah. we create myth? Yeah, by creating work. By creating work. And, you know, we're, we come off of a generation of filmmakers. I mean, that's what the 60s and 70s was about for so many different people. I mean, you mentioned yeah. Sidney Parks, Ossie Davis, Ruby Dee. They were Harry Belafonte and Sidney Poitier were producing movies. You know, they were producing movies. Buck and the Preacher, talk about a reframing of the Western, sure. right? It sure. becomes hugely important. Yeah. And in the middle of that cohort is Ruby Day. I mean, Cicely Tyson is also there, that people mm -hmm. are working in front of the camera, but also behind the scenes. And those, those legendary figures you just gave a, gave a shout out to, much respect, much respect. But the only revolutionary oh. is Melvin Van Peebles. Here's a, I mean, he just completely kicked over the table. I mean, he just, he, it's a whole nother. In fact, I'm trying to think, has there been, well, that's a, something that's probably, has there been a woman as outrageous as, 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 as um, who was, who was the female? But I think it, but, but you're asking for similar, different energies. Like, yes, I am. And I, because to me, um, you know, Daughters of the Dust does something similar for it's how so we- polite. And it's good, but polite. Because it, it, it is because that's her point of view, in, yes. right? It's uh, not a male point of view. It no, is, no, no, right? It's feminine. Um, I would say, well, you know, this, 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 film this, also- in fact, huh? I think the most fierce folks on the planet are women. So let's, let's not make that gender based. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think we need room for like all tones, right? It yeah. can't just be, it just can't be the Absolutely. angry, angry tone. Oh, no, no, no. Yes. It's, and, 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 and by the way, it's not that it's, Melvin was angry. <laughs> Melvin simply said, we're going to win. Yeah, yeah. I mean, He's the trickster, I mean, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, if you think about George Floyd, which could put, completely change the world. I mean, George Floyd is a character in Sweet Feedback. He's the guy who gets killed. But, but instead of going to court, um, Sweetback kills the cops. And for the rest of the movie, he's being chased. So it's a very aggressive, it's very, um, very um, uh, male, military. very classically, you know, but you know, black but, exploitation comes out of that in a way, like as a, as a, black, well, black exploitation was, was a, was a, um, a, 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 a capitalizing on the a, idea a, a, a perversion of it because yeah. they took the black outlaw and made him a black cop. Sheriff works for the, for the police. Everybody works for police. Well, but there's Pam, I mean, to me, that period, I think about the Pam Greer movies and mm -hmm. uh, Tamara Dobson, where mm -hmm. it, it's eye-opening to see, first of all, they're lead characters. Like, yes, or, the absolutely. thing of Black women as the lead, because we're the leads in our own life. Let's be honest about this. I'm not like anybody's effing right. sidekick, you know right. what I mean? Right. Like, I'm the lead character in my life, and that's how we walk through our world. Yeah, we don't see that replicated for us out there in mass media, in the- But, but, but help me understand then, I mean, Pam is a really good friend of mine. So 
how how does she change the 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 um the archetype yes she she's she's the lead and she kicks butts but how does it fundamentally change in a way that three back changes um I, you know i don't know if i want to compare that i don't you know i don't i i want to i want to say that it's different and um because she's not directing and writing right, so right. she is you know it is about opportunity and control over narrative mm -hmm. but it these are stories um um about women in the neighborhood who see something wrong take sure. it in their own hands to like why is that not harriet right? Like, isn't that the same thing? We've always been women in our community who see yeah. something wrong, who want to change the narrative. Yes. And our point of view is not acknowledged in the present culture, in the past culture, and unless we do it ourselves. And, and, I'm, and that's I'm, really I'm, what we're talking about. And right? and I'm so glad you made reference to Harriet, because surely the historical uh, person, Harriet Tubman, was as fierce as you're going to get. And you can't, I mean, there's I mean, my favorite anecdote was uh, uh, when, when, when John Brown was organizing a raid on, on Harvard's Ferry, he would talk to two people. He talked to Frederick Douglass, who said, man, you're crazy, it's not gonna work, I'm not gonna be there. He went to Harriet Tubman, she says, when do I report? It turned yeah. out that she was ill and she couldn't show up. But again, the woman, this I mean, historical evidence, the women are the badass in American history. Well, yes, and he's the one who dubbed her General 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 Tub Tubman. Right, General Tubman. That's right. It, it, and treated her like uh, an equal, and so there's yeah. there though. So, in a way, that points to what is so key for women artists, black women mm -hmm. artists, is allies, people who see you. Yeah, it's not enough to see yourself, right? No, get a stop right there. Is okay. I have to challenge you on that. Okay. Why, why isn't seeing yourself enough? Oh, it's the beginning. It's everything, right? Like it's, it's, it's everything. It's everything. I, but I'm to saying, advance I'm, why isn't in the beginning the business, end? Mm -hmm. to advance in the business means allies. You know what I mean? So I could, so for instance, even how I come here, Warrington, I'm here because you tap me. Nobody else. <laughs> Right, but but, and, but, all, but I, I, thank you. But all I did was pay attention and recognize. But I mean, that's you, being but, seen. Yeah, I hear. You, I, see, hear. I you know I'm a documentary filmmaker. I make films who you know that have lived their like lifespan that they've become classics. People have told me this, right? Exactly. Help get me into exactly. the academy. Um, but I don't have an agent because I'm not seen as sellable. Yeah, maybe right? Tim said richer. But go on. Yeah. <laughs> But then somebody like your, for instance, your brother taps me for another project. And mm -hmm. because you all are in spaces where you're investing not only in yourselves, but mm -hmm. in seeing other people to give them opportunities because we're nothing without opportunities, right? right? right. It, that there is, and that it limits our ability to output over the long haul, right? in many cases. So. All, all that's true, but you as, 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 a, as a woman of color have a, a, a self-identified constituency that, that can be monetized by speaking to them with, with, with content that the main system won't ever do. See, the problem is when you bring your inside, well, here's it. Once you're recognized by a corporate America and financed accordingly, they're going to defame you. They're going to take away all your claws. You won't maybe do any of those things. And so the only way for your voice to be uncut, or to quote your movie, unbeaten and unbossed. Unbought and unbossed. Unbought and unbossed. <laughs> okay, excuse me. Thank you. Yeah. Which I love. It's the most brilliant title ever. So, but if you're going to do that, you have to stay on the outside. Uh, okay, that may be true. Uh, but, you know... Uh, what a, and maybe that's what happens, right? Um, somebody just put into, I think Pamela just brought up who's on policy mm -hmm. and my white season, that we have many examples of women who have been able to make one or two films within the system. And then it's very difficult to continue sure. the opportunities, you know, um, don't, don't um, keep but, coming. But, Darnell but, Martin you, is an example of that. Perfect example, but right? difficult, so difficult. I think of Nima Barnett. Be, but deep, um, Nemo, she and I are contemporaries. Yep. Nemo Barnett is amazing. But then we have women 
who are the newer generation and we were talking about this earlier because we haven't talked about tv right like uh, um but we have women like shonda rhimes and ava oh, duvernay absolutely who, like powerhouse powerhouse filmmakers but they're also and and or create content creators but yeah. they're also incredibly great business people that yeah. it takes the kind of, I guess, multi-hyphenate way of walking through the world to be able to capitalize and play on your own terms in those larger corporate environments. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna say something really, um, you know me, I'm, I'm a radical guy. Um, uh, and I'm gonna I'm use an analogy. It's, I'm, I apologize in advance for everybody who's offended by this. But, but I, I use Black history as, 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 as analogous to my experience. So there was the, quote unquote, field niggas, house niggas, sharecroppers, and runaways. And, and I'm suggesting that, that um, let's take the runaways of people like in Brazil, the, you know, who, Zumbi, who created Colombos, Colombos in, 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 in the mountains, or the people in, in Cuba, in the Palanques, or in, in Mexico, the Cimarrones. People have always created these free territories. Now, the sharecroppers, post-slavery, uh, you know, or even uh, you would, you, they give you some land and you, and, you, and you create content and they take the majority share. Now you make some money, but it's not the money that the master gave you. And so, so I, I just use that, that frame to say that there's a great opportunity and a greater risk. And I'm looking for more people, you know, to take it. And yeah. I, and, and I'm going to talk to you as a woman right now, though, like the okay. part of the issue is that when you, um, you get, you can do that when you're, single and then when you have kids um if you yeah. choose to have children it becomes a whole different ball game and you have to it takes 10 years out of your life right like out of your creative life you have to yeah. be able to feed them and clothe sure. them educate sure. them sure. and you know i so i look i look to people like madeline anderson she was like i'm gonna edit i'm within the pbs system i'm gonna right. so her own personal creation is um you know is is tapped for a moment and then she comes back to it right i think about kathleen collins right who makes one beautiful film and writes and writes and writes well she had health issues right but you know it's the pressure of being able to having to also care for your family and your community while all, while being an individual and creativity is selfish it's important but it requires carving time out for yourself and it becomes hard if you're the center of your world or your little group. You are absolutely right. And, it's, it's, and, and that's simply the question that hopefully each individual knows that's what's at stake and makes the choice accordingly. Yeah, but, and, but, I, but you know, this is where I go back to the, uh, the women artists like that who are in the generation before me is that life doesn't have to be short. Life can be long. Right, and that it can have various seasons. I think the best feminist advice I got was um, from my first boss in, in a filmmaking, and she was a producer. She just had kids. She was like, you know, blah blah. She said, "I wish somebody had told me um, you can have it all, but you just can't have it all at the same time." Interesting. I like that. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, exactly. Or, or, or James Brown says in the lyrics. You got to pay the cost to be the boss. Yeah, you got to pay the cost to be the boss is, is another way. So I like to think that um, my slate, right? It might take me longer because of all of the obstacles and the more machinations, but I'm getting there. I just have to live to be a hundred. And what, we have women who do that. Yeah. Right? No, I, I, I'm, I'm betting on you. I think you're going to do it. Okay. Okay, Warrington. I, I love that. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> So, so uh, are we going to, we should, because again, this is the ongoing conversation we have and I'm, I'm so tempted just to be selfish and just go and go, but I want to make sure that uh, there are people in the chat who have some things they want to jump in. And by the way, you guys are shy. We'll, we'll go, we'll, we will get away with this because um, yeah. this is a, a, a wonderful endless dialogue that we, we participate in. Yeah, and I do want to I, I do want to um, just take two minutes to shout out the hundred women hundred years hundred women um, project um, because when you first came to me I was going to make a short film about Black women filmmakers right 
And then the pandemic happened and um, you and Avery put your heads together and said, well, what about documenting this moment? And it was such a pleasure to be able to um, work even remotely um, to pull together a short film that documents the hundred women thinking about hundred years (laughs) of, of women's suffrage and have that kind of physical evidentiary um, uh, example in the the short piece, but also in the archive that is created. And so definitely want to shout out all of the beautiful work that was part of that project Um, and love that it's online. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah, Yeah, and and, and I'm happy also that anyone who'd missed this um, Sovereign Time, did you see it? Oh, I missed it. Well, this will be online as well. So your piece will be there as well as the, uh, this conversation we're having now. And for those of you who are not late for the future and you bought an Oculus Quest headset, you can see the piece the I produced called the Cine Film Cypher, where you see all these brilliant women together in a hip hop cypher doing the same kind of critique. Yeah. So, do we have any questions? Or are we? So then, okay. Yeah, they, they were warned. They were warned. <laughs> so let's talk about things you have seen recently that, that are eye-opening by either made by or uh, performed by women of color. Sure. Um, I... so I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off. This is, I'm watching a, a series on Netflix. And I, you probably haven't seen it because it came, it was, on a, it was a very, on a, it was produced three seasons on a, a marginal network called Crackle. Crackle, no. Exactly. So it's, it's owned by Sony, and it is so it's 30 episodes that's finished. It is the most mind blowing series, drama series I think I've ever seen. How is that for hyperbole? Okay. The main character is a Cuban American uh, woman who's like a computer expert. And the storyline intersects blockchain and, 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 and cryptocurrency and Haitian gangsters. And this young woman who's Cuban American uh, computer expert. It's amazing. It's called the startup. So that's the kind of freshness. You know, I said, oh, this is a character I've never seen before. So I wonder if, if there's anything you've seen recently that said, oh, this is fresh. Um, you know, I the the and I'm thinking about film films in particular. Um, and um, Maddie Diop. Uh, mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Film um, who the the name of the film, but. It is is um, Atlantic, the Atlantic, right? The Atlantic, yes. Um, was so stunningly beautiful in both um, story and in visual. Um, yeah, absolutely. That I get drawn to, you know, films like that. I I really enjoyed. The, I mean, I don't want to quibble about the the cut, the script or whatever, but Queen and Slim, I mm-hmm. loved. Yeah. You know, the way it made me feel in parts. Um, I wish the story kind of took us in, in, a, in a different direction, mm-hmm. you know, because the thing for me is our stories don't always end in tragedy. That's the, the, the narrative, that's the other person's narrative, that there, right. we, we have people who win mm-hmm. and telling the stories where we win, we get away, we yeah. whatever. We, is not what is accepted by the broader culture. Absolutely. True. Yeah. And um, so yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to uh, fight about the end. <laughs> okay. no, no, in, in fact, yeah. I, I, was, I was good until the end. But <laughs> I also, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, but I've also enjoyed lately the Black Lady Sketch Show. <laughs> okay. I, I, what, what about the, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm so embarrassed I can't call her name. I know her really well. Uh, she did the the the, um, the action movie on Netflix. I uh, saw Shirley oh. Theron. Gina Prince. Gina Bly- Bly- Prince Bly- oh my God, she's that one was- of my favorite directors. And that's all a time. Great group. She's a black woman doing an action kick butt movie. Yeah, that's I love what, that. It's nothing about it. I say it's not about gender. You can be, you can be a woman making a kick butt action movie. It's about opportunity. Yes. 
it's about opportunity and the opportunity not just to be a cog in the wheel. Like mm -hmm. I know, you know, people tell me about her that she likes to do her rewrites, et cetera. So mm -hmm. not just director with somebody else's words, but to be able to um, impact the content because it matters. It's, it's what you were saying earlier about maintaining mm -hmm. a sense of independence so that yeah. you can assert control over the content. I yeah. mean, yeah. It, it's why being an independent filmmaker in so many ways is the way to go. I agree with you. Or being an independent artist, right? That you're but, not feeding well, the... the discipline. I mean, Donnell Martin has a script about Tulsa. And if, if I hit the lottery, it's going to go in production. I mean, it's that good. It's like, it's just riveting. So women, I'm telling you, we are losers by not giving women the mic. It's just dumb. America's dumb, men are dumb. Women can tell the full story in a way that's just absolutely riveting. I'm not gonna disagree with you there. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not gonna disagree with you. And I think the part of what uh, we, I, you know, like, I don't want to stereotype, but when you've, as a woman, you have to have empathy for other points of view often, right? Because you're trying to keep families together or, you know, you're trying to be Switzerland or you're trying to like steer people in a, in a direction. So you have to be able to talk to their, all different kinds of people. And it's just not you physically asserting yourself on their landscape. Biologically, we just don't do that in that way always. Sometimes we do, right? Like act, we can be action heroes too, but that it allows for different ways of understanding and feeling and emoting and experiencing. And so I completely agree with you. All of it is needed. It's not a hierarchy one over the other. Precisely, precisely. It's that we benefit from more than one point of view. Absolutely, absolutely, without a doubt, without a doubt. And all we can do now is just look forward to those opportunities, you know, either uh, granted or created. And so right. that the story gets told and, and, and we all, all, all the viewers get benefit. I can't mm -hmm. wait. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And, you know, I would say, though, that one of the other things that comes to mind with when we talk about opportunities is that we as women are socialized um, to play nicer and often, and having been somebody who was involved in sports early on, I was terrible because I didn't know how to compete. But once you learn how to compete, you learn how to throw an elbow, you learn how to win a race, you learn how to talk a little crap, right? It applies to, um, to all of this in terms of business. So what if somebody doesn't like your work? You have to, right? You have to like your work and you well, have to find your the way. Good, the good news is Avery Willis Hoffman and, and the Paul Carlton, the Armory and the Met, they like our work, which is why we have this event today. I want to wrap up by saying thank you, thank you, thank you. And we, we as, a, as a movement, will not let you down, you know, and I'm going to be a cheerleader and a facilitator at every opportunity because these women, I have the privilege of knowing are beyond the off the hook, off the chain, off, literally off the chain. Thank you, Warrington. What a pleasure to have this conversation. Thank you, Warrington and Shola, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Alexis Gonzalez, and I am the Program Coordinator for Audience Development and Engagement at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. My pronouns are he, him. I'm a Latino male with short black hair, and I'm wearing a dark gray shirt, and I'm sitting in front of a beige backboard. I join you today from Los Angeles, California, the land of the Tongva and Gabrielenio people and the Akcha Chaman and Huanyenyo nations who have lived and continue to live here. I also want to recognize and pay respect to the Tongva and Akcha Chaman nations and their spiritual connection as the first stewards and traditional caretakers of this land. Thank you to our brilliant and generous panelists today and to our audience for joining us for the 100 Years 100 Women conversation series hosted by Park Avenue Armory and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. All of the panels will be archived in the 100 Years 100 Women website, which you can visit at 100years100women.net. We hope to see you at our next conversation in August, on August 13th, and encourage you to visit our website to learn more about the 100 Years 100 Women project, the commissioned artists and their work, 
and resources and related programming currently offered by partner institutions. We will end today with Our Sisters, Daughters and Mothers, a Southeastern Woodlands contemporary women's honor song created and recorded by Martha Redbone. Whoa, Honor our daughters, honor our sisters, honor our mothers.